वीर्यम करवावह तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तुमाषावह Yesterday we stopped at uh, the nature of awareness, consciousness, which is referred as the self, which is the very abode of the bliss that we are seeking, the happiness that we are looking for in this world, and every living being is looking for the same thing. No one is different. The world, it's an ant or a bird or an animal lives. It's the same world where you and I also live. And what they are looking for is what we are also looking for. There's no difference at all. But where they are looking is where the difference is. While they are very happy just eating and breeding, this human being is trying to explore what is around oneself and then trying to find the same happiness by intellectually intellectual appeasement and curiosity being fulfilled, but at the same time as one evolves, the spiritual awakening takes place and to realize that what I am looking for is actually within myself. Only when we realize that the journey has to be taken towards oneself, only then spiritual life will begin. Until then, we will have spirit, a lot of spirit to drink and to make merry, to enjoy the enjoyments of the world and then we get drowned in that. So here, the Upanishad says that once the inner journey begins, then you realize how difficult is the mind, how difficult are the thoughts to take care, to regulate, to handle, to maintain inner equilibrium, inner balance, peace, in spite of the things that are happening around us. And we usually become victim of our own thoughts. Therefore, there are methodologies where we can use to make the mind a little more disciplined called concentration. Anyone who would like to achieve anything in life must Focus on what he or she wants to do. Concentrate, we say that. And you don't we say to our children, hey, concentrate on your studies. Upanishads use the same word concentration, but in a different context or a different connotation. They don't say it's concentration, they say it's contemplation. The difference between concentration and contemplation is only one thing. When you focus on something outside, it is concentration. When you use the same focus within, it's called contemplation. So this chart would show you, this is actually given by Krishna in Gita. Vyavasayatmika buddhihi ekeha kurunandana bhushatahi anandrasya buddhira vyavasayana. An unconcentrated mind is split into many branches. A concentrated mind is focused. It is similar to that of if you have a paper on the, on the, on the surface and if you use a convex lens, the light of the sun will start burning that very paper. While if you do not have the convex lens and just the light, it would not do anything to that paper. What makes the sunlight become a powerful energy is the focus, right? You might have experimented this. So when the sunlight which is spread out, when it is focused through the convex lens on a given paper, it starts burn. It starts to burn that completely. In the same way, mental energy is available to us all, of, uh, all, of, all the time, but we do not have focus. It's so dispelled, dispersed to be precise, either worried about the past or anxious about the future, as Swami Chinmayanda used to say, 
our mental energies are dissipated by either the worries about the future, the worries about the future or the regrets of the past. So at any given point of time, you look at your mind where it is. It's either regretting for what happened yesterday or previous day or so many days back. Or it is anxious about what's going to happen tomorrow. Somewhere I read, today is the tomorrow you were anxious about yesterday. You're anxious about tomorrow and the next, when the day begins, then the anxiety moves to the following day. And this way, our mind is constantly preoccupied. And this way, it's not available for focus. So that's why when you are using, you are writing your CV, you write your last name, first name, gender, etc. And then when it comes to occupation, you should feel it preoccupied. <laughs> that's our occupation. <laughs> you are not available at the present moment. So focus or concentration is on something external, an object. The same focus when it is presented to, towards inside, within, then it is referred as contemplation. Contemplation is a prerequisite for dhyanam in meditation. Now in the Yoga Sutras also, or the steps of yoga also, yama, niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana and Dhyana. The Dharana is called concentration, contemplation to be precise. And then Dhyana, the attempt on meditation, then Samadhi, avoidance. So, since our mind is so dissipated and not available, there is a need for us an external form to focus on. It's unavoidable. Every religion has got some symbol of God outside to make us focus. A Christian go to a church and find a cross there. In Indian context, there are many different gods. Every day you can have one. Anyway, the idea is to make your mind focus on something. The symbol is unavoidable because that's how the mind can be made to find its rest. You have a concept of God, but it is mind is unable to focus on it, therefore your external symbol is necessary. So any inspiring idol or a symbol is a, as an ideal representing one's goal and bringing consciously thoughts towards the same kind, a similar kind. It is Sanskrit known as Sajatiya Vritti Prabhaha. Sajadiya of similar kind, vritti, thought, pravaha, flow. Thoughts of the similar kind flowing towards a particular object. This is called contemplation. Presently, what we have is vijadiya vritti pravaha, with going in different, different places. If you give a Harry Potter book to your child, then how concentrated the child is. Uh, give, give him a math book, it won't be. Why? The interest, the love, the joy, the entertainment that is there. Or seeing a movie, uh, how a person is so focused on that uh, character or the movie or the storyline. We all have that. What we need is love. What we need is an admiration, a respect, a seeking. And that's why we began with the whole idea. We need to seek the higher then the natural focus on what we want will take place. So, practice is discarding unwanted thoughts by refocusing again and again. So, externally when we do that is concentration. Internally when we do the same thing is contemplation. Now, in the Vedic times, in the Upanishad, there is no particular God is referred. As I told you in the first it's the meaning itself. So, they have used the sound symbol Om this is also known as Pranava. Om, the very sound, consists of three letters or three sounds A, U, and M. Mm. As we have discussed in the previous session, we all go through these three states of experiences waking, that's where most of us are, 
I can't say all of you, but most of us are there. Some of you may be still dreaming. Or, and so the, you, who representing the state of dream, and mm, representing the state of sleep. So whenever you open the mouth, the first sound comes is ah. Last sound is mm. In between is oo. So this ah, oo, and ma become om. It consists of three letters or three sounds. So when you are chanting om, usually, actually it has to be chanted as oh That's how it should be chanted, but usually start with om. We usually chant as O and M instead of A, U and M. So Mandika Upanishad talks about it very carefully about the three different states of experiences represented by three matras, three letters. This OM is like X in a mathematical calculation. You don't know the value. What OM is unknown. It's there, but you don't know what it is. Just like in the math, you apply various values to x, and then finally you find what the value of x is. So also, om is presently is not our experience. It is said to be there within us as our own self. That's how the Upanishad point out. But while thus we continue to chant om and focus on that which is beyond the sound, I'll come to that a little later, beyond the sound, you reach a state, as we discussed yesterday, beyond the state of waking, dream, sleep, and the fourth one is Turiya, the state of awareness where you are externally by other for others you are asleep, but internally you are fully awake. It's a wakeful sleep, meaning you are not using your mind or the intellect or the sense or the body to experience this, but you are awake and aware I am. Presently, if I ask you, are you there, you externally you say, I am, right? Are you there? Are you saying, I am? When you are sleeping, if I ask the same question, what is your answer? When you're sleeping, if I ask, are you there? Would you answer? If you answer, then you're not sleeping. I can't answer because I'm not there. I'm not using my body. I'm not using my... I can't even hear you. I don't hear you. I don't see you. But that does not mean I'm not there. I'm not available to, for, to respond to you. I'm not available to be part of the world. But I am. I'm not absent. I'm absent to the world, but I'm not absent. I'm present. So in the state of deep absorption beyond the deep sleep is where an individual knows that I am, but not as it is expressed during the waking state. It's not through the mind, it is not through the thought, it's not through the emotions, it is not through intellectual conclusion that I am, but I know I am. Uh, this is what is referred as Sat, existence your presence. So the Om is to reach this point. So the chanting of Om is not just to invoke or call for any God. It is not to address anybody. It is not to call for some grace. It is not call for some help. It's a, 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 it's a journey you are taking within yourself and reaching that point of stillness where you are aware awake, alert, available, fully aware, uh, conscious, but not as a thought. So therefore, the target is Brahman, not an object, emotion, or a thought. This is what Upanishad, Manduka Upanishad beautifully puts. It's like uh, take a bow with the target in mind and take an arrow and place it on the bow and after having placed the arrow on the bow, what do you do then? Aim at the target and then huh? drop the arrow. <laughs> no, after aiming at the, uh, the target, 
focus and pull, is it not? Pull the string along with the arrow. And then, after having given enough stretch, you feel that now the arrow can be released so that it will have the momentum to reach the target. Let go. The most important point is to let go. Only when you let go, the arrow will be released from the bow and reach the target. Pranavodhanu sharo hyatma brahmatal laksya mujjate apramatte navetavyam sharavattan mayo bhavet Om is the bow. Pranavodhanu sharo hyatma. Mind is the arrow. Brahmatat Lakshyam, the Brahman is your Lakshya, the target. Apramatyen, without erring, with, with a great alert, alertness, Vethavyam, to be placed or to be pierced. Then once it is released, Sharavattanmayo, the mind becomes one with the target. So many times people chant, but they don't let go. The chanting is to bring the minimum thought in your mind. Now the mind is going in different directions, very many thoughts. But chanting Om is meant for bringing the mind to one single concentrated Om. And that brings the awareness of oneself as that very Om itself. And having brought the mind to single awareness of the chanting the Om, let go. Somebody is talking, I don't know what the sound is. Translation. Translation, oh, okay, okay. Okay, so I'm sorry, I don't know that. Now, shall we practice that a little bit now so that you will get an idea about what it is? So, the Om to be chanted, please watch this. You have to chant Om loudly to start with and then give a little space before you take the next chanting. Then again chant Om, give space, chant. Then again chant Om, space. So you can use it along with your breathing as well. That will be more powerful as, uh, as you breathe in. Chant Om in your mind and hold it for a while. And then release the air, exhale, chant Om. And then stay for a short moment out without breathing in. I'm sure you are taught about that. Then again, chant Om, chanting within your mind, hold it for a while, then chant Om, exhale it, externally, Bakir Kumba, leave it, then. So we practice that if, since you are all uh, students of yoga. Just close your eyes and inhale first, chanting Om in your mind.
the longer the gap you give, greater will be the inner stillness. The experience of awareness is not a particular thought, though when you are chanting and leaving for a while and again picking up the sound, you may find that there is silence. And then your mind will say, oh, there is silence. So this thought would arise that there is silence. I'm experiencing the silence. I'm observing silence. Even that thought of observing, I am observer of silence to be dropped. This is the practice of Pranava Upasana, of Omkara Upasana. So reaching Brahman is possible only by let go of the mind through the meditation with the help of Om. Space being the most subtle among the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, space, and sound is the nature of space. The sound symbol Om is the means to transcend and reach Brahman. So Upanishad clearly points out that Edad alambanam sreshtam, edad alambanam param, edichanto brahmacharyam charanti, tatte padam sangrahena pravakshe, om tat idi. So Katopanisha said, that's I'm going to tell you what it is, because of which great masters practice great self-control. I shall teach you about that practice of om. So, as I have been explaining, the, it is not to, to, to invoke any particular form of God or asking for grace or asking for some blessings. It is to make our mind go within and in that inner journey, what is most important is just like the arrow from the bow has to be released, after stretching, you let go. After chanting, you let go. So that chanting leads to an inner deeper silence. In, in that silence you let go of the mind. Let go of the mind means don't think at that point, oh it's nice, oh it's beautiful, oh it's quiet, I hope everybody is watching me. All these thoughts will arise. I think I am a great meditator, I am better than others. This kind of uh, uh, owning up of that experience. So the japa usually is also another method by which you can uh, keep your mind focused. As you might have already been initiated that point, that using a japa mala is also useful. Move the head bead between the middle and ring finger with the thumb. Move the bead towards you while chanting the name of God or Om. Keep the altar or symbol of God, Om, in front of you in your vision. Little while later, you can choose to close your eyes while chanting, remembering the form symbol in your mind. Become aware of any other thought coming before, during, and after chanting. If there is a distraction due to other thoughts, rolling the chapamala will pass. Noticing you, this, this you become alert and let go of the distraction. As the mind becomes capable of chanting without distraction, it is the chanting from love to whisper and then only in the mind. Follow it by silence and trying to maintain silence as long as you can. Chanting with loudly is useful because the distraction will be reduced by listening to the sound as well. Chanting under the under the breath, whisperingly, that is only for you to hear. Once you become master in making your mind focus without making a big sound or chanting, then chant only in the mind without any external sound. And by, by just doing so, you are within every breath you take home within Exhale, Om, stay silent. Inhale, Om, observe silence. Exhale, Om, stay silent. And extend that silence as long as you can. That's the practice which is prescribed in the Upanishads. Now, the secret of realization is this way. I'm not going to explain in detail about this, because, as we have seen, our inner tendencies, vasanas, are those which are causing the desires in the mind, then creates thoughts, thoughts lead to action, action leads to the way we react to the world. So the, the reverse process, I fell again. <laughs> sorry, thank you. Yes. The reverse pass process is, the reaction is where we create the likes and dislikes. 
So action as prescribed should be performed with as a dedication to higher power, karma yoga. It reduces the intensity. Thoughts can be surrendered to a higher altar. It removes the selfishness. And then the knowledge of the self, as we've seen, gives you more attention on the inner tendencies that are expressing in different ways or to overcome them. Finally, to realize the self through meditation, to going within and deepening your inner awareness. Now in this context, I have to speak to you about the most important part, and that comes the last one, the four declarations of the Upanishads. As you know, four Vedas are there. Rik is Rik Veda, the oldest one. Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda. All the four Vedas have indicated the same goal. The goal is same. The highest happiness, the absolute bliss. And it is not, as I have said it before also, not any particular god to worship or not any ritual to perform or not any place to go. It is to go to, it is only to realize your own being as the blissful self. That being the goal, all the four Vedas talk about the same thing, but they put it in a different ways to reach the same point. These four Vedas are declaring the four major statements. They are called the Mahavakyas, or considered as the great statements. Great not because of its uh, huge statement, great because their what they say is so important. The first one which is coming to us is in Sanskrit, Prajnanam Brahma. Consciousness is Brahman, the absolute reality. This is called Lakshana Vakya, or otherwise known as statement indicating the truth. It's like when you are traveling somewhere, you know, somebody, if you are lost your way, somebody has to tell you that, hey, go that way. Or you need a GPS, right? A GPS, what is GPS? Global Positioning System. We call it as Guru Parampara System. <laughs> GPS is Guru Parampara, the lineage of teachers. They teach you exactly if you are lost in your way. So say, no, this is the way to go. So Lakshana is to indicate the nature of things. So here, first thing is, what is the nature of the absolute bliss which I am looking for? Your own self. That your own self. Now let us look at the important point here. If I am aware of this, what it is I know. This is called in Sanskrit Jnanam. Jnanam means knowledge. But I am able to understand or know what this is because I am aware. If I am at, in the state of dream or deep sleep, this may be there in front of me, but I am not able to become aware of this. So my awareness of an object is primarily presupposes awareness of myself. This awareness of myself is called prajnanam. Knowledge is to know an object. Prajnanam is to know yourself as a subject. If I am seeing something through my eyes, first of all, I am aware that I have eyes. <laughs> without which I can't see a thing. Right? If I am smelling something, I must be aware, first of all, that I have nose. With the, that nose only I can smell anything. So what is close to me is to be there before I know anything other than that. If I am hearing the thunder, thunder is happening somewhere else. But what is experienced by me is here, in my ears, right? I am seeing you, but you are there. But where am I seeing you? In my eyes. When you go further close, in my mind. When further you close, in my awareness. In my awareness alone, I'm seeing. In my awareness alone, I'm hearing. In my awareness alone, I'm hearing. All things are taking place in that subject awareness. And that is a substratum of all experiences. So this awareness, I am. Consciousness is Brahman. So that's the first statement. And it has three different uh, nature. One is Sat, Chit, and Anand. This is the indicator by the teacher. Who are you, first of all? You exist, right? Do you have a doubt about that? I have no doubt that I exist. 
even if nobody agrees to agrees that I exist, I exist. Not only that I exist, I know that I exist. And I don't need anybody's proof for that. I don't need anybody else to tell me. Then why I do why do I exist? To be peaceful, to be joyful, to be blissful, ananda. So what is the nature of the self? Sat existence, chit awareness or consciousness, ananda, the bliss. So this is actually the definition of God. According to Vedanta, God is Sat, Chit and Anand. Existence, consciousness, bliss. So this consciousness I am, I exist, I know I exist, I know I exist only to find that purest happiness. Sat, Chit, Anand. This is what the teacher first indicates to the student. Understand that one whom you are seeking is of the nature of Sat, Chit and Anand. But why is that I am not able to stay in that condition? This is called Adat Vyavrutti Lakshana. To say that because you are identified with so many other things, your body, your mind, your thoughts and emotions and me memories and feelings and, and prejudices and judgments and opinions and likes and dislikes and a whole thousand different things, give up. All identification you have to let go. This is called atatvyavritti, letting go, negate all that. That's not you. That's what you have, but that's not what you are. I have this uh, cloth, or, uh, I'm wearing this cloth. I have this cloth, but I am not this. I am my cloth. In that is the case, I cannot never leave this. I have a thought, I am not a thought. This way, you start thinking, I am not what I think I am. I am, therefore I think. Uh, so the Western world gives a different connotation. You think, therefore you are. That's what science would say. And there are enough people who are not thinking, but still they are. <laughs> so I am, therefore I think. And I am, even without thinking, in the state of sleep. I am, therefore I think. So this I am is independent of all that you have, you possess, you own. The third one it says in the same point is Tatastha Lakshana. It's difficult for us to comprehend. Therefore, there is a associated ideas are given. Like for example, if I say I'm alive because I think my body is alive, because my, my, I have a feeling I can feel my body, I can see. Therefore, if, you, if I ask you, are you alive? Yeah, I'm alive. Why? Because you can see me, I can walk, I can talk, I can talk, I can see, hear. Therefore, I am alive. But this is not, it's not because of body you are alive. It is because of you, the body is alive. Think. It's not because of body you are alive. If because you are alive, your body is. That's the reason why at the time of sleep, you are able to let go of that body. More of it, you would probably speak about it. The sleep specialist. It's, it's not because I have the body, therefore I'm alive. I'm alive, therefore the body is. All religions accept it. Otherwise, you will never go to hell or heaven if you are only the body. Body is lying down there in, in the, in, in, under the earth. Where are you going? Who is going? Anyway. So, associated thing, let go of it. So, therefore, here, the, what is the nature of this supreme self, it is prajnanam, that awareness I am, independent of all, that is what it is. So this is called, this is called indicator, it's called a statement of indication. The teacher who is talking about this is a person who has experienced it. Therefore, he says, aham brahma asmi. This is called anubhava vakya or experiential truth. So, this Guru's personal experience alone is his authority. Not because the scriptures, books say, or somebody said, it is my experience. Is it not true that if I ask you, is fire hot? What is your idea? What, is your, what do you think? Is fire hot? Huh? Is some, somebody's opinion? Is somebody use that as an opinion to you? Or it is your experience? 
If you put your hand in the socket, what happens? Have you tried? <laughs> Definitely all of us in this room have experienced at least once. Who, anybody here who has not tried that? Not that you have put yourself somewhere, I want to find out, but accidentally it happened and you know now what it is. You have any doubt? If somebody says, no, it doesn't give you shock, maybe for you, but for me, yes, <laughs> I know it. So that is called experience. I have no doubt about that. Similarly, the teacher here is not speaking because some scripture says so or my teacher said so. It is me, I know it. Therefore, aham brahma asmi. This is the statement of experience. And because of which alone the guru is able to convince this teach student. I am the source of I thought the awareness is Brahman, the substratum of all dimensionless, timeless, immortal presence. So the Guru's personal experience is what his authority of speaking. His own personal experience alone makes him so convinced that he, what he says to the student is absolute truth. So the second declaration is Aham Brahma, as it's coming from Radharani Upanishad. So first statement is Prajnanam Brahman, awareness is Brahman, consciousness is Brahman. Second is I am that Brahman. Uh, so the third declaration by the Upanishad is the teacher says, not only I am, you also. It's not I am special here. It's not that I am specially chosen by the God to experience it. You are equally chosen and you are, if you choose yourself. Tat, that, consciousness, tvam, you, asi, are. The warp, that, that is upadesha or the state form of advice. So you, meaning what does, he, what does he refer as you? You is devoid of the limited identification with the body, mind, intellect, are, that, that, devoid of godhood, the creator of the universe, omniscience, etc. See, usually the religion talks about God as the one who created the whole universe and all the plant kingdom, animal, etc. No doubt, it is, that's what we call it as God, the creator of the universe. But who is that God? What is his nature? It's also the nature of the same consciousness which I and you and everyone is. Hmm. So like if you say the president of a country, yes, it's a position because he is given to that particular position to take decisions on our behalf. But that person is also human. I am also the same human, right? I am alive. That one is also alive. You, the, bigger, the biggest uh, living being is also alive. And the smallest of the smallest is also alive. Anuraniyan, Mahato Mahiyan, Atma Sijanto, Nito Kuhayan. That which is present in the innermost chamber of all beings is the consciousness. Externally, they may, a dinosaur will appear huge. Is it a huge life? No. Life is the same. Presence is the same. Like, if you have the brightest light, also the same power, the smallest little one is also the same power. The power resides in the, all the equipments but expressing differently. Therefore, you, without that external identification, are that. That which is remotely experienced as God is none other than the one who is sitting in your heart. This is called the advice to the student, and the student goes in contemplation, practicing his quietude of the mind. Deep within him, he slowly, slowly realizes that the presence of that pure awareness in his deepest quietude, he realizes that and comes back to the teacher and says, I am Aham Atma Brahma. This self is Brahma. This is known as Anubha Anusandhana Vakya, realization of the student. So, this is basically to say the self awareness without thoughts is the absolute truth, the nature of pure existence, consciousness, bliss. It becomes the experience of the student. It started with indicating the teacher who is experiencing speaking about it. The student is taught by the teacher and the teacher and the student comes to realize this. These are the four important statements of Upanishads.
the, the first one is Prajnanam Brahma, the consciousness is Brahman. Second one is Aham Brahma, I mean I am the Brahman. The third one is Tattva Masi, you are that. And the fourth one is I am Atma Brahma, this self I am is Brahman. So this is the most beautiful part of the Upanishads and all the Upanishads declare the same in different ways. Now, continuing, the The culmination of evolution is in the form of, as the, in yoga practice also it is given, sa vikalpa samadhi, attempt to experience godhood, deeper concentration with awareness of the self along with awareness of distinction of knower, knowledge and the object of knowledge. In this state, the knowledge of the self manifests in spite of the awareness of the relative, like you are aware of the clay and the elephant, both in the clay and elephant. So, when you see an elephant made of clay, you are aware of two things. What? The elephant, as well as what it is made of. In the same way, the state of samadhi as the eighth part of the yoga is where a person can have two, part, two aspects. One is sa-vikalpa, along with thoughts, nir-vikalpa, without thought. When a person gets into the sa vikalpa samadhi, he is aware of himself plus aware of himself as awareness. He is aware of the world, yes, but aware of the world is none other than the uh, expression of awareness. Just like I see a wooden table, I am aware of two things, table and the wood. But without the wood, there cannot be table. So when you say wooden table, it's wood appearing as table. Similarly, I am the self, the self appearing as who I am. The word, word is, the self is appearing as the word. So this way of experiencing the awareness is sa vikalpa samadhi. Nirvikalpa samadhi is where individuality is completely lost. Absorption without self-consciousness in total emergence with the self, the distinction knower knowledge and object of knowledge is obliterated. In this state, self alone remains and the mind is no more, like the salt dissolved in water, in which the water alone remains. So many masters who have reached near Vikalpa Samadhi would not come back to exp explain to us. Uh, it's like a person who has gone into a state of total absorption, is no more available for the world. Whereas many masters who have come to inspire us, teach us and take us to the higher level are those people who came back to the world where you and I live and started to speak about it only to take us to that state. And therefore, Nirvikalpa Samadhi or without awareness a person reaches and that person would not return back. So most Mahatmas and great masters who have, having taught these people who are interested to know, Finally, when they leave the physical body, they take to Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And that's why they are, they, we, we observe those days uh, as the Maha Samadhi of a great master. I think you have, uh, what's called, November? November, right? November? Third? November 9? Nine. So where the Maha Samadhi of uh, Vishnu Swami, Vishnu Nivananda, where he has absorbed himself to the higher. Similarly, Swami Shivananda also. It was uh, July, right? 14th of July. Yeah. So where he has reached the Nirvikalpa Samadhi, where he is no more coming back to us to teach. But most masters who have reached Savikalpa Samadhi, they compromise to go there because they want to take more people to that state. So they speak to us, inspire us, guide us, teach us. And once their work is done, they go into the Nirvikalpa Samadhi. It's like salt, salt is put into the water, then you can't you know, see the salt indistinct from the water anymore. It is merged. So that's the union with self, the liberation, according to Adi Shankara Acharya, is like water mixes with water, light combines with the light, space merges with space. You cannot distinguish anymore. The person has become one with the totality, the universal oneness. So that universal oneness without any distinction of re region, religion, caste, color, creed, 
belief system, faith, concept of God, language, and all distinctions is the teaching of Upanishads. Upanishad teaches about that absolute oneness, oneness and reaching which only a saint truly becomes a great lover of the world, lover of entire humanity, because he cannot see anymore any distinction, either by the physical distinctions of the people, with respect to gender or animal or human, plant, any other, any form of life is same to him. Any belief, any faith, any religion, any caste, any color, any kind of uh, uh, culture, he doesn't look at the distinction anymore because he has reached that absolute oneness which pervades everyone. That's the reason why such saints who have become an exalted ones are most adorable because they reached that oneness pointed out by the Upanishads. Thus, this uh, presentation comes to an end. So, there are obstacles in this reaching there which need to be very carefully avoided. Sleep, lack of concentration, attachment and enjoyment. These four may probably disturb one in the state of Samadhi and we have to therefore develop an ability to uh, get away from the usual tendency to go to sleep while meditating. That happens often when you are physically tired. Therefore, the best time to do this is when you are fully alert and especially when you do yoga and etc. when your energy is very high, that time when you sit for meditation will be most useful. Not before going to sleep. Then it will become meditation, become an aid to sleep. So don't do that. Similarly, the lack of concentration. This also is another major issue. People say, oh, my mind is going all over. So use the OM as the effective tool to quieten the mind. And attachment to all that past experiences that we tend to keep repeating in our mind. This also can cause disturbances. And also sometimes when a person is in the deep meditation, enjoying the inner bliss, and become attached to that. That is also causing trouble. So, these are all the four important obstacles one has to overcome as Prashankaracharya. Thus, this presentation comes to an end, and I am so happy that all of you could uh, learn something out of this. And I am given this opportunity to present it to you all in these four days. I hope you have some glimpse or some idea about what the Upanishads are. When you go back to your places, do try to learn systematically Upanishads. Because this cannot be picked up here and there. If you try to do that, you will not understand the process correctly. What I have given is only a, just a small glimpse of what it is. But each Upanishads had, each Upanishad handles the subject matter so deeply so when I go back to my center, I have been giving the talks on the Upanishads. It takes quite a bit of time for people to understand the logic behind it, the system behind it, the systematic teaching behind it. It can be learned. It can be easily learned. There are so many different translations are available. You don't need to depend on the Sanskrit on which it is written. There are many different uh, great translators who have written on this. But usually you should go to an authentic source, especially when it is a translation of Shankaracharya's translation uh, in English, the Bhashya or the original document, the commentary. That is the best thing to learn because the authenticity of the Guru is very important. Now anybody can write a commentary, but the authentic source is very, very important. So when you, are, you plan to study Upanishad, you go to the right source. It's very important. Then only you will understand the logic behind this. Thank you so much for making this happen. My salutations to all of you and salutations to the great gurus who have been guiding us. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschid Dukkha Om Shanti Shanti